<sighs> the streets of New Capenna. Eh, they're a rough mistress. You could spend your whole life walking in dark alleys and see the underbelly and still find something that shocks you every night. I've seen a lot of dark days on this plane, far too many to count. For every multiversal threat I throw behind balls, there's another Phyrexian or Eldrazi right there to fill the void vacant by the last crime lord. I guess I'm just getting old, getting tired. This city of angels ruled by demons. It's enough to make any Johnny Law go belly up. But I know one who ain't like other cops. She says she's a knight of some kind. Well, she sure as hell has the moral code of a knight, I'll give her that. But it's gonna take much more than some fairy tale to fix this city. The filth. It's spilling up from the gutters. And only Elspeth can clean the streets of New Capenna. And she better watch her neck. The knight errant Elspeth Terrell had always been a soul adrift. Since the devastation of her native home to the Phyrexians, Elspeth has traveled the multiverse in search of another plane to call her own. Time and time again, she found little acceptance or peace. She believed Theros could be her adopted home, one protected by benevolent gods, only for those same gods to betray her out of jealousy and fear. If not for her ardent friend, the Leonin, a Johnny Goldmane, Elspeth's spirit would have returned to the blind eternities, lost to the ether for all time by the hands of the sun god Heliod. Though she was Heliod's champion, the god feared Elspeth as a planeswalker and stabbed her in the back, mortally wounding her. Thankfully for Ajani's actions, Elspeth's soul went to the plane's underworld, where hope for her return remained. Through trials of nightmares and fear, darkness and blazing light, Elspeth fought her way back to the realm of the living. She offered the god of the dead, Erebos, a trade he couldn't ignore. She offered him revenge against his greatest rival, her own adversary, Heliod. This time, Elspeth was ready for the fight and wouldn't turn her back on her foe. Though she faced a god, she felled the divine once before, and again, she would triumph. Through deception and skill, Elspeth offered Erebos a soul for a soul, taking Heliod as his prisoner in the underworld in exchange for her own freedom. A bittersweet end to the terror the sun god had reigned over Theros' pantheon for untold eons. Through muck and grime, Elspeth crawled from the underworld and breathed in life once again. In leaving Theros, she lost a home, and still the remnants of her past haunted and hunted her. The god of fate, Clothes, felt Elspeth had cheated her destiny in escaping the realm of the dead. The god crafted her a hunter, someone who would chase her to the ends of the multiverse in order to restore fate, Kallax. This planeswalker would search for Elspeth no matter what plane she traveled to, meaning she would never be safe, and without safety, she would never feel at home. Elspeth instead turns to an old ally of hers, her dearest friend, Ajani. She meets Ajani on Dominaria, a plane she had only visited once before, but knew her friend fondly shared experiences. Ajani is shocked to see his friend again, alive no less. Questions of how she escaped the underworld sputtered from the Leonin's lips, along with words of joy. But their conversation soon turned somber, as the wounds to Elspeth's body and soul had taken a toll on the once honorable knight. She longed for a peace she seemingly would never have, a home she didn't believe existed. Despite Ajani's lecture about finding peace and home from within, Elspeth needed something more at that moment. She needed something real. Ajani is initially reluctant to share the information he had discovered, but ultimately believes it can help heal her battered soul. He had found her home world, one she believed lost to the Phyrexians long ago. She was so young then, and she spent much of her life in a Phyrexian prison, but Ajani assures her that it still exists and it's called New Capenna. Ajani had joined forces with Karn and the Gatewatch, who were now looking to face the growing Phyrexian threat. They discovered attack plans, those targeting New Capenna, and their research also showed that this world had been attacked by the Phyrexians in the past, an incursion the plane managed to resist. 
They don't know what these plans mean or what the Phyrexians hope to gain on New Capenna, but if they manage to beat the Phyrexians once, a Johnny and the Gatewatch want to learn how. Elspeth leaves for New Capenna to unlock the secrets of this world's past, but to also find a home. The plane initially feels so foreign to her. It's nothing like she remembers, but truthfully, she doesn't have much of a memory of her past to begin with. As she walks the crowded streets, she sees statues of angels fighting against creatures. Creatures all too familiar. Phyrexians. But here, in New Capenna itself, there seems to be no trace of her old adversaries. She now seeks New Capenna's history in order to unlock her own past. Another lost soul of the multiverse has been searching for a home. Not a home lost to memory, but one to replace one that was destroyed. Vivian Reed has been carrying the memories of her plane, Scala, locked within her arc bow. It's the life force of Scala itself and all its creatures. This is her eternal burden, as the final daughter of Scala. Her plane was destroyed, collateral damage in Nicol Bolas' war against the multiverse. Now Vivian is searching for a world like Scala, one that has achieved a balance between nature and civilization. She travels to New Capenna in search of that home, but what she finds is far from it. New Capenna is a fractured plane, the city a gem, locked in a tarnished setting. A barrier separates New Capenna from the devastation and ruin outside, and within this bubble, progress hadn't ceased. Nature had been replaced by cold hard steel, crude reproductions of what wild was once here. This plane had tilted too far in civilization's favor, a model Vivian knew from experience was unsustainable. Despite knowing this, she continues down to the bowels of New Capenna, its seedy underbelly, in search of roots, long lost connection to the plane's past. But deep below the surface, she finds something far more intriguing. She's approached by a hooded figure, someone who picks her out of the crowd as one who can recognize a planeswalker. They introduce themselves as Tezzeret, a name Vivian recognizes from the War of the Spark, the name of a man who fought on the side of Bolas. She's suspicious of Tezzeret, but he still offers her an audience with an ally of his, someone named Urabrask. That name is less familiar to Vivian. While she traveled to New Capenna in search of a second Scala, she had inadvertently stumbled upon something much bigger. She doesn't know what Tezzeret or this Urabrask are planning, but it could very well bring another War of the Spark, a fate she wouldn't let befall any other world again. Vivian keeps a low profile and a great distance between them, but agrees to meet. She's only more intrigued, as Tezzeret assures her that they're all on the same side, the side of freedom. Vivian racks her brain. Tezzeret, the man who had fought with Bolas, he was on the side of freedom? She had her doubts, and rightfully, tightened the grip on her bow as they proceeded deeper and deeper into the core of New Capenna, to the ruins of Old Capenna. Here, secluded and abandoned, were the remnants of a world lost, packed, solid, and dead. As they walk, Tezzeret begins to glow a sickening crimson, a light like none other poured from his being. It was his token of good faith, the Planar Bridge. During the War of the Spark, Vivian had heard of this bridge from her allies, but she had not known it was part of Tezzeret himself. This red, otherworldly glow, he admitted, seemed to be a result of his most recent passengers, a corruption of sorts. Those he's ferried across the multiverse? The Praetors of New Phyrexia. Tezzeret hid no secrets. He made no attempt to hide his allegiance. That word, Phyrexia, sent a shiver down Vivian's spine. Though she had never experienced them herself, members of the Gatewatch and other Great Planeswalkers had whispered tales of their evil, an all-consuming force that ended all life on any plane it could reach. And Tezzeret was helping them. Was this the freedom he spoke of? Vivian immediately protested her continued involvement. Why should she trust a man who is in allegiance with the Phyrexians? Tezzeret surprisingly agreed. He was in league with the Praetors of New Phyrexia, but only because their leader, Elish Norn, had promised him something for his services. Something that wouldn't matter if every plane in the multiverse was Phyrexianized. While he did indeed help her per their agreement, he too in secret worked against her aims, if only to look out for himself. 
If Vivian didn't want to know more, he offered her a free shot from her bow. But Vivian couldn't do it. If the Phyrexians were a threat, and Tezzeret was working against them, his plan at least warranted an audience. The pair continued to Urabrask. As they enter through a tunnel, Vivian sees him, a hawking beast that must have been at one point an apex predator. Now, however, the Phyrexian was barely breathing. What used to be its organic components were seared off as if dematerialized, leaving only shining, sharp metal and a weak, hobbled creature. Tezzeret claimed it was a side effect of the planar bridge. Urabrask's low-toned voice called it a betrayal. Vivian approached the predator of the Quiet Furnace. She could kill it in this state with just her bare hands, but the enemy of my enemy is my friend. She let Urabrask speak, its metal scraping voice described of Elish Norn's hostile takeover of the various realms on New Phyrexia, including his own. She has dominated them all. Her plans are to snuff out organic life throughout the multiverse, a vision he and his Phyrexians of the Quiet Furnace do not share. Urabrask was different in many ways. Rather than submitting to homogeny, he wanted nothing but to be left alone, as he had also offered to others, even the non-Phyrexians of Mirrodin. Under no circumstance would he ever submit to Elish Norn. Urabrask had a plan, to challenge Norn's claim to New Phyrexia and to lead a revolution. But first, he needed allies and the substance found here on New Capenna, known as Halo. It was a powerful substance that would aid in their rebellion, but it wasn't the only thing he sought on this world. In joining forces with Tezzeret, Urabrask had learned of a planeswalker named Elspeth Terrell, who happened to be on New Capenna as they spoke. Urabrask remembers her as a powerful warrior. She did substantial damage to the New Phyrexian forces, but that wasn't all. It was known to the Praetors that Elish Norn feared Elspeth. That alone was enough to invite the planeswalker to their side, to unite against Elish Norn. Vivian, digesting all this information, agreed to help. Urabrask needed time to recover from the planar bridge, and Tezzeret needed to return to Elish Nor to assume his cover as a willing ally. Vivian would be charged with bringing Urabrask as much Halo as she could for him to research, and to track down Elspeth. With everything said, and the threat of New Phyrexia standing against everything she held dear, Vivian agrees and signs a pact with a Praetor hoping the members of the Gatewatch, when they hear of this, give her a chance to explain everything. From a past long forgotten, the five major families of New Capenna had risen to prominence and influence through underhanded schemes and power plays against each other and the city's citizenry. With the ruins of a lost plain surrounding them, their oasis had become a war zone over limited resources. The stronger you are, the more you had. The basic rule of survival on New Capenna. A war waged between the Obscura, Maestros, Riveters, Cabaretti, and Brokers all while a new upstart looks to upend their stable power struggles, a mysterious figure slowly siphoning manpower from the other families known simply as the Adversary. Xander, the vampiric head of the Maestros, has a keen understanding of New Capenna and its history, and he should. He's lived long enough to remember almost everything about it, but still there's more knowledge locked away from him. He's become the curator of the rarest artifacts found on New Capenna, all in the effort of archiving its history and unlocking his past. Though Xander's first concern is always supporting his family and ensuring their power, but he does like to dabble in other, more scalegic enterprises. Still, Xander can't let the day-to-day -day of New Kepena get away from him, or risk losing his family's influence. He has heard through the grapevines that the Cabaretti were set to unveil a new source of their most precious resource, Halo. Halo is what runs New Kepena. More important than money or allegiances, Halo is the most cherished thing in this city, and those who control the most of it can rule everything. As the families squabble, it's over this most potent of substance. Now the Cabaretti say they have a new font of Halo, or at least something like it, that would change all of New Capenna and usher in the dominance of the Cabaretti. Xander is curious of this font, and sends informants to Mezio, the central hub of the city, to find out more. The Cabaretti, the nightlife and soul of the New Capenna citizenry, they're led by a Leonin, a larger-than-life figure known as the Grandfather, but also known as Jetmer. 
He set to unveil the font to the people, an endless source of Halo which would secure their hold over the plane. Their family is the life of the party, and now they bring hope to everyone, without fully grasping what the font really is. They dabble in forces they don't fully understand, a secret now known by the adversary, whose rise to power had been quick and unrelenting, shaking up the well-established five families of New Capenna as fears of a new family threatens to upend their organizations. In their effort to control more power and information, the Maestros are doubling recruitment efforts as well as shakedowns. Xander's second-in-command, Anhilo, looks to discover what he can to further his family's influence, but in Mezio, he finds someone he wasn't expecting. While shaking down a laundromat for extra kickbacks, they aren't aware of a new hire by the owner who doesn't take kindly to their… aggressive approach. Elspeth Terrell had been taking odd jobs all across New Capenna, slowly coming to learn of this place, but still feeling as if this wasn't truly the home a Johnny had claimed it to be. In this laundromat, Elspeth first experiences the troubles of the ruling families here. As the maestro muscle push back against the girl's threats to stop, Elspeth takes the fight across the city streets. The brutes covered themselves in steel plates and used swords, daggers, and magic to assault Elspeth. While running was no longer an option, she grabbed a steel pipe and showed these ruffians just who they were dealing with. She had bested two gods in her life. These mutts were nothing. Anhilo was in charge of this group and was fondly impressed of Elspeth's beatdown of their enforcers. Her skills were indeed impressive, and would be very useful to the maestros. They could offer her coin, a place to sleep, the best food and fashion, and even Halo. Halo, the thing everyone wants. But Elspeth wants something else. Knowledge. Tomes and statues of the plane's past, wonders he promises their head, Xander, could show her in exchange for a few… jobs. Her mission for Urabras was clear. Acquire Halo and find Elspeth. Both required information, and information required work. Though Vivian didn't want to join one of New Capenna's families outright, they did offer the occasional job, which is how she found herself as an informant for the Obscura. Everyone on the plane was buzzing about this font the Cabaretti seemed to be in the possession of. An endless supply of Halo. Vivian at first wanted to steal this font and give it to Urabrask, but found the Cabaretti compound far too secure. So she did the next best thing, traded information on it to others for what she needed. In describing the Cabaretti's movements as they prepared to unveil the font at their next crescendo, their end of the year bash, Vivian is in exchange provided with information on smaller stashes of Halo and anything else on this Elspeth character. Vivian was in luck, her contact had a lead, and Elspeth had recently joined the Maestro family and was doing odd jobs for them. In fact, she was set to drop off a supply of Halo in a few nights, the perfect chance for her to make contact and procure some of the precious research material at the same time. While tracking Elspeth, Vivian hears more of a shadowy figure known as the Adversary. In fact, an unknown Maestro agent would be meeting with his contacts from other families very soon. As a maestro footman, Vivian half expected Elspeth to be at that meeting. It was promising enough to pursue so she could at least get an idea of who this Elspeth was before introducing herself. In crashing a shady lounge she discovered was one of the adversary's hideouts, Vivian catches the whispers of a conspiracy. Elspeth was nowhere to be seen, but the other family's reps were all trading secrets openly to those who had an ear of the adversary. The crescendo of the Cabaretti seemed to be the most pressed topic of conversation, the family members all pledging loyalty to the adversary and affirming that they were ready to act on his behalf. Vivian, however, was not a welcome guest here, and no amount of blending in would work. An obscure agent sniffs her out as a fraud and chases her through the streets. From the shadows, the skilled assassin leaps at her with a dagger, and Vivian is without her bow to defend herself. Luckily, Vivian isn't totally unprepared for combat, pulling a dagger of her own and plunging it deep into the gut of her assailant. Her enemy clung to the blade and to life, as Vivian strips them of a notebook, they carried on them and left them to the gutters. Vivian feels that New Capenna is nearing a breaking point. The world's tentative balance was about to be upended by this adversary. She needed to reach Elspeth now, before it was too late.
Elspeth has formally joined the Maestros, knowing their access to knowledge of the plane's past could prove invaluable to her and the Gatewatch, learning how exactly to defeat the Phyrexians. She had met with Xander, the family's leader, but only in passing. As she was new, Elspeth was left doing grunt work, filing and cleaning curious artifacts. She tried to understand their meaning with every angelic statue she dusted, but there was never a clear picture. She needed more. That's when Xander introduces himself to his new kin. The vampiric head of the family noted that Elspeth had been skilled and diligent in her work, but that she also wasn't pursuing more responsibility. That was code in New Capenna for blood work, the handling of more mortal problems. Elspeth explains that she only wants to learn of New Capenna's past, obtain knowledge, not spill blood. But Xander offers that knowledge can sometimes only spill from the veins. Xander offers her the chance for more specialized jobs in exchange for a glimpse of his knowledge. Elspeth found herself as the maestro's new courier. She was charged with transporting illicit material from their family compounds to other customers, often members of other families. It was odd to Elspeth. She believed that these families were at war with one another, but that was only half true. The truth was, by Xander's own admission, that the families lived in a balanced society. They all played by the same rules and trusted each other to do the same. If one family gained too much power, that power would be tempered when dealing with weaker families. It was the unspoken rule of respect that governed New Capenna, a balance now threatened by this adversary person. Elspeth had delivered packages of Halo across the city, tracked a maestro family member as they performed their own shadowy duties, and protected them. Protected them from, oddly enough, raccoon folk, who had jumped her in an alleyway. And still, there were even more jobs to be done, all at Xander's request. Elspeth even petitioned for a weapon to protect herself with, especially from other raccoon attacks. But she was only given a dagger. But this little gesture was a symbol of her rising rank among the maestros. She had done well. And now it was time for her reward. Knowledge. Xander goes into more detail of their city's founding, an event long since past that he was in fact present for. New Capenna was founded by an alliance between angels and demons. Though natural adversaries, they joined forces in defiance of another external threat that they couldn't ignore. The enemy of my enemy. The angels created New Capenna as a safe haven for the plane's denizens, far removed from the conflict itself while the demons set up the five families to run things in their stay. Elspeth was amazed, but she needed to know of this enemy they fought. And how did they win? She knew it was likely the Phyrexians, but this is what she needed to know if she were to bring it back to a Johnny and the Gatewatch. It was information Xander himself didn't have. Despite being there, the pact he entered in with the other founders of families, a pact that made them all half demon, well its magic clouded their memory a gap that Xander looked to close with all these relics he collected. That was information he simply didn't know, but he did know that this alliance between angels and demons succeeded, because obviously they were still alive today. Xander also went into a deeper explanation of Halo, the substance so coveted by New Capenans. He poured two glasses and shared it with Elspeth. Its colors swirled like a constellation caught inside a cup, as if it were bottled stars. It was neither a liquid, solid, or gas, but more like concentrated mana. As it touched her lips, her body filled with vigor and purpose. Weak muscles were restored, and she felt as powerful as ever. It was no wonder people were fighting over it. Xander said it was the last gift of the angels before they disappeared. He didn't know why they left them Halo, maybe just for pure indulgence. But Elspeth suspected there was more. But to get that information, more jobs were needed. Elspeth's next job seemed rather mundane. Drop off more Halo at a predetermined location, a park bench with an empty paper bag. The drop off seemed easy enough until Elspeth felt a hand grasp her arm with lightning speed as she approached the target. The assailant didn't strike, simply holding her arm there suspended. Elspeth studied the woman and found no trace of New Capenna about her. She was a planeswalker. It was Vivian Reed who had finally caught up to her target. Though Vivian needed to bring her back to Urabrask, she wasn't going to assault and kidnap a possible ally, especially given how important their friendly predator made her sound. After proclaiming that her and Elspeth shared the same goal, they were able to talk on common ground. 
Elspeth explained that she had come to New Capenna because she believed it to be her home, but moreover to learn of its history. She was working alongside the Gatewatch, a group Vivian was also familiar with, and Elspeth wanted to find out of this ancient threat, and how they could use that knowledge to stop that threat today. All while Vivian had someone very interesting that Elspeth should meet. Still, now wasn't the right time. There was more to learn from the maestros, and she couldn't show disloyalty now. Vivian agreed to let Elspeth go about her family business, but promised to reach out to her again once she had learned more from her contact, Urabrask. Of course, working with a praetor is something that Vivian kept close to her chest. It's something best Elspeth experienced in her own time. Elspeth returned back to Xander with the job done, and a new ally on New Capenna. Returning to the boss, Xander offers her a new opportunity. The adversary is making moves, and so are the Cabaretti. Xander isn't certain, but the balance of the families is starting to tilt. This font the Cabaretti control with infinite halo, and whispers of the adversary planning something during the Crescendo event. The maestros needed to get involved, and Elspeth was the perfect choice, as she was still a relatively unknown face in the city with little connections to this family. Her new mission? To go undercover as an unaffiliated person to the Cabaretti's party organizers of the Crescendo. Work her way into the organization and learn everything about this font. The adversary cannot get his grubby hands on it, so she would procure it for the maestros. At least it would be in their, ahem, <coughs> trusted hands. In exchange for this final mission, Xander promised Elspeth unfiltered access to his entire archive. Everything the plane had to offer was at her fingertips, and in it, the secrets to defeating this ancient threat. Elspeth agrees, gets new digs, and works her way through the ranks of the Cabaretti. Vivian had made contact with Elspeth, the person Urabras needed to face off against Elish Norn. The mortal, the head of Nuphorexia feared more than any other. If the Praetor's revolution was to succeed, she needed to be a part of it. And returning with this news, Urabrask was disappointed to not see Elspeth with her. Vivian explained that their mutual ally needed to find something on New Capenna first. Answers. Answers that would go on to help them in their end goal of stopping Nuphorexia. Vivian feared that the whole structure of New Capenna was coming to a breaking point, a failing she shared with Urabrask, as that would likely be the point that Elspeth would be willing to join them. Urabrask, unhumorously, remarks that they should break it faster. The truth was that Urabrask needed time to heal, time to study Halo, time they would give Elspeth to find out these answers and come willingly. Vivian remarks that when they were ready, she would know where to find Elspeth. This crescendo was all the city was buzzing about. It was an event too big for any of the houses to miss, and she knew the maestros would likely send their newest prodigy. With all the rumors swirling about this party, and this conspiracy being laid out by the adversary and his minions, it would no doubt be the plane's breaking point. But at the mention of the adversary's name, Urabrask speaks. It was a name that was familiar to him, one spoken by Tezret as he explored the surface. The adversary was a demon but one like them, a planeswalker. Vivian searched her memory of the War of the Spark, looking for any person specifically that would meet that description, but none came to mind. Nonetheless, Urabras cautioned Vivian to not face this adversary unprepared. Despite the warning, Vivian grabs her arc bow and gets ready for the crescendo. If Elspeth was going to be there, Vivian would too. If the world would to break there, she would protect Elspeth and secure their best hope to stop New Phyrexia. Adversary or not. On the eve of the crescendo, Xander, head of the Mephesto, laments on happier days of New Capenna's past. Somewhere in his museum of curiosities and relics, he was sure this plane was, at a time, not consumed by feuding families or war. But that's a past he and the rest of New Capenna had forgotten. He knows that this night, with the Crescendo and the Cabaretti unveiling their font, there will undoubtedly be bloodshed. But he too feels a glimmer of hope, not from his family, but from an outsider, this Elspeth. He knew when welcoming her to the Mephestos that she would never truly be a part of their family. She was unlike anything New Capenna had ever seen. A relic in her own right. She was not bound by loyalty or family ties, but by what was right. 
And although Xander couldn't claim her as a Mephisto, he did count on her to save this world from the coming conflict. And deep in his old, aching bones, he felt like that conflict had arrived. While his trusted allies in right hand go off to attend the Crescendo in his stead, Xander is approached by a heavily armored figure, skulking about the shadows of his sanctuary. The shadow casting from his huge body is draped by a pair of wings and topped with terrible horns. The adversary was finally making his move. The adversary didn't come alone. He didn't fight fair, already acting like a well-established head of this city. With him flanked on all sides were vampires of Xander's own family, cutthroats who had traded their loyalty for promises of more Halo. These fickle hearts deserved no place among the Mephisto, and Xander would see to their... expulsion personally. With a twitch of his long clawed finger, the advisor's minions, master assassins all of them, leapt toward their former father, their hands grasping the daggers he had once gifted them as a sign of respect. Luckily, he never gifted weapons he wasn't well versed in defending against. Daggers glistened in the museum hall lights, and Xander revealed a sword from his walking stick. He may be old, very old, but his experience was enough to cut through these turncoats. While his skills weren't in question, his stamina very much was. He couldn't fend off the army of betrayers the advisor had recruited. Xander retreated back through his collection to a one-way hall, where he could strategically pick off his pursuers one at a time. A quick mind and a quicker blade that could offer him a chance to escape. But still, it seemed the city had forgotten loyalty overnight, as assassins kept up the chase. Xander still knew his sanctuary better than anyone in the family. He designed it and built it himself. Of course, leaving secrets all throughout just in case things got... hairy. Rummaging through hidden doors and secret passages, the Pratter and Blasting of Spells started to distance themselves from him as he makes his way to a balcony. Again, a shadow envelops him. The Adversary, a true master who had both the skills and perseverance to make waves on New Capenna. While Xander correctly assessed the strength of his opponent, that didn't mean he'd surrender. The vampire went for his blade, jabbing, thrusting, and feigning strikes at his much slower opponent. The adversary was heavily armored, but Xander spied a crease between the helm and jaw, a vital weak point. As he makes his move, he's surprised by the demon's sudden speed, deflecting the blow and forcing the maestro back. Xander didn't even see the adversary lift his finger before the smoke reached his nostrils, and a loud bang rang through his ears. As the magic cleared, he realized the spell had ripped right through him, a power not known to Nukapenna, perhaps granted to him by some demon ally lost to the plane's past. The questions riddled Xander's mind as he steps back into thin air, falling from the balcony. The adversary had toppled the maestro. Elspeth had been tasked by the maestro to infiltrate the Cabaretti family and get close to their font. Elspeth couldn't care less about the squabbles between these families, but this job would grant her access to Xander's vast knowledge of Nukapenna's past. Knowledge she needed if she was going to defeat an even greater threat, Nuphorexia. Joining the Cabaretti was easy enough. She was, for the most part, unaffiliated with other families, and after a few odd jobs, she found herself paired with the Cabaretti's number two and on the floor team for the Crescendo. The Cabaretti are a strange bunch. They seem to only care about frivolous parties, while the other families wanted power and control. But to say these things also didn't matter to Jetmir, this family's head would be a dangerous miscalculation. But still, they hid their bloodshed behind pageantry, as seen by Jitmir's closest members, a fabulous singer named Kit, joined by her muscle, Ginny, and a meek young girl named Gaida. These three would be Elspeth's point of contact during the crescendo. Her job was easy enough, walk around the party floor with plates of food for the guests. Yet, handing out cheese-stuffed pastries wasn't Elspeth's focus. She needed to find out what she could about this font and return it to Xander. Once she had her answers, she needed to find Vivian Reed again. That planeswalker knew more about what was going on and would likely be a valuable ally in the coming conflict. Still, in the back of her mind, the threats of the adversary made her nervous for this evening. Things had reached a boiling point here on New Capenna. 
Of the three henchmen of the Cabaretti Elspeth had met, she was most curious of Gaida. She hadn't known the girl for long, but she seemed far too young and innocent to be willingly caught up in a criminal organization. Her eyes didn't have a flicker of malice or ambition to them. They seemed empty, much like Elspeth's eyes must have appeared long ago when being raised in a Phyrexian prison. But however she felt, Elspeth needed to focus, for the crescendo was about to start. Ginny invites Elspeth behind stage where her, Kit, and Gaida are preparing. They move a giant clear jar onto the platform as the curtain rises. She watches on as the helpless girl, Gaida, is brought forward as Ginny rings in the praises of the cabaretti. When the signal is given, a line saying New Kepina will change forever, Elspeth and everyone else in the audience are blinded by a glaring light. All Elspeth could make out was Gaida placing her hands on the pot before she blinked away. When the flash subsided, the jar had been filled with a swirling cosmic concoction, Halo. There was no trick, no deception, they had created Halo from nothing. But as Elspeth studied the curious Gaida, she understood the truth. The girl wobbled, being held up by the others as the crowd screams out in applause. Somehow, this seemingly unassuming girl was rather quite extraordinary. She was the font of the cabaretti. Her eyes explained more than words ever could. She was exhausted and without hope. Making Halo was all that she was good for, and that was her place in New Capenna. She was a tool, a device for others to get what they wanted while disregarding Gaida's needs. It was a feeling Elspeth herself had felt once before, a hole that's been sinking her spirit for years now. She didn't know Gaida, she barely knew New Capenna, but being here for this girl just felt right. Rather than joyous revelries coming from the crowd who just witnessed a miracle, cries of terror and screams of rage rang out. The adversary had made his move at the crescendo. With countless turncoat minions casting aside the symbols of their former families and joining a now chaotic battlefield, the adversary had promised them power and halo, and now they had the chance to claim it. The font was found, and immediately, the adversary's agents rushed Gaida. Elspeth pulled out her maestro dagger and fended off those foolish enough to think her nothing more than a waitress. Cries from cabaretti officials drew the attentions of Kit and Ginny. Their leader, Jitmir, was under attack and wounded. They left the font and rushed to his aid. Elspeth was now alone with a scared child who has known nothing but pain, the same place she had been once before. But now she had the power to change that circumstance. Elspeth grabs the girl and leads her through the melee, all while defending her from the brigands looking to take advantage of her power. After cutting their way through the blood-soaked dance floor, Elspeth finds an old door to the back alleys of the building. Unfortunately, some of the adversary's minions spot them leaving. It was their master's orders that none survived the crescendo. It was three versus one, but Elspeth had seen worse odds before. But she didn't need to press her luck. She wasn't alone in this fight. A green arrow glows through the night sky and lands at the feet of an assailant. A Viridian wolf pounces from the impact site and sinks its fangs deep. Vivian Reed makes her grand reappearance, noting that she has Elspeth's back, as a volley of arrows lets loose a menagerie of spirits, overwhelming the thugs. As things start to calm down, they're joined again by Ginny, but Elspeth is hesitant to return the girl. She doesn't know the full story here, but she knows the look on Gaida's face. If she wants to return, she can, but if not, she would protect her. Words are not exchanged, but a simple tug of Elspeth's arm is all the confirmation she needs. Ginny doesn't much care for this treason, but isn't given time to act, as a green dragon is summoned from Vivian's bow, giving the group a chance to escape. Vivian questions why she took this cabaretti girl, and Elspeth explains as best as she can the empathy that she needed at this time. Vivian reaffirms that there is much more going on here, things of much greater importance than the infighting between New Capenna's families. Elspeth agrees, and once Gaida is safe, they could continue on their way. Vivian agrees to see that the girl is safe, but is firm in saying that her partner needed to meet. To help Gaida though, Elspeth needed more than just this dagger, she needed a real weapon. She leaves Gaida with Vivian and runs back to the Maestro Sanctuary. Surely, given the circumstances, Xander wouldn't mind her taking something with a bit more heft to it. But as she enters the museum, she can hear the sounds of unfamiliar voices. 
intruders, those who had betrayed their family for this adversary. As she hit around a corner, she picked up on them talking about the crescendo and her fleeing with the font. A hit has been ordered. Everyone on New Capanna were searching for her and Gaida. Elspeth grabs a sword from the wall on instinct alone and left the fallen house of the maestro behind. Together, the group escaped to an abandoned warehouse to sleep through the night. The city had plunged into chaos. All the families had been compromised. Riveters were killing people in the streets. Maestro assassins had flooded the alleyways with blood. And all in service of the adversary. Though Elspeth had no particular dog in this fight, the dark solemn eyes of Gaida had become a beacon and a promise. The girl had been nothing but a font. But it wasn't her purpose to save the city. Not like this. Finding truth, finally in the words of her friend Ajani, she tells the girl that purpose is found from within. Words she finally took to heart. In the night, they're startled awake by movements. Vivian wants to leave immediately, but there wasn't time. The doors of the warehouse swing open as Ginny and the Kebaretti enforcers rush in. Despite Elspeth's noble attempts to keep Gaida safe, she was considered a traitor to her short-term family. Vivian's bow is knocked away as Ginny pulls a knife to Elspeth's throat. Her hand is only stayed by Gaida, who plays a victim who is grateful for Ginny's rescue, but also petitions that her captor's fate be decided by their father, Jetmir. The planeswalkers are shackled and led through obscure tunnels and safe houses. Everyone was compromised, so the Kebaretti had to seek out friends wherever possible, including other families. They reach the obscure compound and are presented with a mortally wounded Jetmir, who, in true Kebaretti fashion, is nothing but jovial even as his life is slipping away. But before he and Gaida could be reunited, or the Leonin could pass his judgment, the doors of the secret hideout swing open as a sea of Riveter and Maestro traders flood in. It seems even the Obscura had been compromised. Elspeth finally lets loose some of her unique Planeswalker magic, glowing bright and shattering the shackles of both her and Vivian, impressing her ally. She knocks out the teeth of the Kebaretti who confiscated her bow and cuts a path through the chaotic close quarter fight so that the group can escape. Elspeth is overwhelmed, but she would do anything, even risk her life, for Gaida, giving her the chance she never got. A Riveter's hammer slams into her chest. She coughs up blood. A maestro assassin throws a dagger. It lodged in her shoulder. Elspeth can feel the cold hand of Erebos embrace her once again. It was a feeling she was all too familiar with. But Gaida is there, her echoing voice calling to her. A glow envelops them as Gaida rushes a warm liquid to her lips. Halo courses through her veins. Her wounds heal. Her vision steadies. It seems like Elspeth now for sure owed her life to Gaida. Ginny, their Obscura ally, and the three companions run from the compound through more tunnels and head for the Obscura headquarters, the Cloud Spire of Park Heights, their last chance at safety. As they turn a corner, Ginny is heard yelling out a betrayal. This was all a ploy, the attack in the hideout, just a means to whittle down the group and separate the font from her protection. The Obscura spies, now all brandishing daggers, jump on Ginny as she fights off her attackers. Though Ginny had only fought for her family, she regarded Gaida as nothing more than a tool, something to set New Capenna right. She wasn't a person with individual wants or goals. It saddened Gaida, but Elspeth and Vivian used the ambush to escape, knowing Ginny wouldn't survive. They jump from rooftops down fire escapes and reach the streets. They duck into an abandoned chapel, finding rows of statues of angels lining the walls. They looked over them with a blank stare, much like Gaida had, whispering in unspoken words. As they walked, Elspeth looked closely at the statues. They glowed, the faintest of gold. Vivian couldn't see it, but her and Gaida can just make it out. Then, the voices. They couldn't understand what was said. They weren't sure they were saying anything. It was more like singing, singing in a language they didn't understand. A chorus meant only for them. Elspeth hadn't noticed it before, but Gaida was glowing that same light. And now looking at her hands, she was too. Elspeth isn't sure what's happening, but a feeling leads Gaida to a conclusion. She was home, with family. Those words finally feel like they have some meaning for Elspeth. She had forgotten what home was, forgotten what family she had left. 
but home to Gaida was a feeling. Her family is where she felt like a piece that finally fit into a puzzle. In this chapel, among the angels, this was her home. They were her family. Gaida had looked inwards. She found her purpose on New Capenna not based on what others wanted from her, but what she wanted. She would go on to protect her home, save New Capenna in her own way. Elspeth still needed to find that for herself, but she didn't have time to digest this all. The chapel's door explodes off its hinges as the adversary arrived to claim his prize. The horns and wings are the first thing Elspeth notices. Vivian is quick to address the adversary by his true name, Obnixilis, a planeswalker. The demon was impressed by their perseverance. His plans for Nukapenna had not taken them into account, and they managed to slow down his progress quite significantly. But no more. It would end here and now. He would kill these two rival planeswalkers slowly and cruelly, and take the font for his own. He would rule Nukapenna with an iron fist. Of course, Obnixilis had brought minions to this fight. He wasn't someone who played fair. Vivian took her bow and launched a volley at the demon, but he quickly disposed of her Viridian wolves with one smooth strike. He grimaced through sharp teeth. Vivian gestured Elspeth. She would take out the minions, leaving her to face Obnixilis and protect Gaida. This was her solemn promise to the young girl. She wouldn't fail her, but if she did fall, Gaida needed to escape, to find safety. Obnixilis grunted, this pathetic rabble wouldn't stop him from succeeding here. Elspeth was the first to move. She expected that a planeswalker of his size would be slow, but she was mistaken. His wings gave him great balance and finesse. The sword Elspeth was using was less than ideal. It was top-heavy, not made with her frame in mind. She was more hacking away than striking, but she took jabs where she could, glancing blows mostly, but enough to stagger the demon at points. But still, it was never enough to throw him off balance, and Nixilus kept pushing the attack. It seemed as if Elspeth would die here, and she prepared Gaida for that reality. But Gaida no longer needed Elspeth's protection. She was home, surrounded by family. The lost angels of Nukapenna, or their spirits at least, considered her their lost and final daughter. As spectral wings sprouted from her back, and that glow intensified. Light shot out across the room, covering everything and knocking Obnixilis back off his feet. A wounded Elspeth could feel the warm glow cover her like a blanket, protecting her, making her skin like armor. The singing of the angels returned in a triumphant chorus just for her, as Nixilis groaned and staggered to his feet. In words only she could hear, mouthed by Gaida, the girl tells Elspeth that she's had the weapon she needed all along. Filled by the wisdom of the angels, she knows her home, her family, her purpose, she always had. She just strayed from the path. Her failures do not define her. Pick up your blade and fight on. As the light recedes, the statues are shattered and Gaida is gone, leaving Nukapenna to be with her kin. She was an angel all along. That explained her spontaneous halo magic, but still many questions flooded Elspeth's mind. Her hand moved on instinct. She reached for her blade, but what she found wasn't recognizable. Her sword had changed, infused by the magic of Gaida and the angels. The blade was smaller, perfectly balanced for her frame and center of gravity. Its hilt had shifted, now a swirling orb of halo, halo which saturated the entire weapon. It was Gaida's gift, a symbol that the right weapon was always near at hand so long as she had a reason to fight. Home was duty. Family was those she chose to defend. She always had them, and now she knew it. Elspeth would defend New Capenna. It was her home. Obnixilis barely regained footing before he was dashing back defensively. Elspeth was on the offensive, jabbing at the demon with her now holy weapon. Nixilis charged up a magical shot, lifting his finger ready to fire. Elspeth managed to dodge past the projectile and lunge forward, each swing as graceful as it was deadly. The demon couldn't defend against them all. He was slowing down and Elspeth continued on. She honed in on his weak point, a gap in the armor around his chin. She dove straight. Obnixilis tried to defend, but he was too slow. The edge cut deep into the planeswalker's neck in a slashing arc. His claws instinctively grabbed at the wound, trying in vain to apply compression as dark blood bubbled out. The air around him distorted. Reality folded in on itself. 
his form collapsed into nothing as the defeated adversary vanished, planeswalking and releasing New Capenna from his grasp. With Gaida gone, Obnixilus defeated, Vivian Reed and Elspeth Terrell can get to the crux of their issue. Yes, New Capenna was in turmoil, still reeling from betrayals all across the plain, and with a dwindling halo supply, surely the city would fall eventually. But all the planes throughout the multiverse were still in danger. The Phyrexian threat had to be addressed. They returned to the Museum of the Maestro to finally find answers. Anilo was waiting for Elspeth. Xander knew his time as their leader was coming to an end. He had a knack for predicting events and somehow knew his own death was imminent. He had left Anilo a note of succession. He would lead the maestro now, and also requested that Elspeth, assuming she survived, should be granted full access to his archives. And so it was. Together with Vivian, they looked over what felt like countless tomes and memoirs. The history of New Capenna laid bare. As it was known, the Phyrexians did attack New Capenna in years long past. The Angels of the Plain did their best to defeat the enemy, but were ultimately unsuccessful. This led to an alliance between them and the Demon Lords of the Plain. With their combined might, they managed to beat back the Phyrexians, but not utterly destroy them. The Angels were holding back, bound to their mercy the demons ending up betraying the angels, trapping them within statues and harnessing their essence, Halo. They used Halo to purge the Phyrexians from the plane, but also left the angels trapped within, as they too vanished in fear of their retribution. They left their stockpile of Halo behind in New Capanna, along with their minions, the family heads who had made their deals, certain they would forget the plane's past and never release the angels. Well, it seems like that history was restored to Nukapenna. The angels were released and left the city, perhaps to continue life on the plane elsewhere with their child, Gaida. But with this knowledge and some stored halo, Elspeth now had what she needed. She could bring this halo to Ajani. It was used to defeat the Phyrexians once before. Perhaps it can be used again. Still, another matter needed to be discussed. This alliance with a Praetor. Vivian had made a deal with Urabrask. Halo and Elspeth were key to his revolution, but Elspeth was less than enthusiastic about working with someone so tied to the enemy. Fighting New Phyrexia would bring back so many bad memories. Koth, Karn, Malira, people she felt she failed. But if it meant ending Elish Norn, Elspeth would fight. For home, and for family. Together they left for Dominaria. It was time to meet with some old friends. That kid Elspeth, she done good. New Cabana may one day fall to its own sins, but the plane, it's bigger than this one city. The angels, well, they'll see to it that peace is restored. Maybe I can finally take a vacation, thanks to that big collar of Obnixilus, AKA the adversary. You know, come to think of it, maybe it's about time I hang up my hat and take a breather. I know there's more out there, more no good billies ready to shake the multiverse down. But they're better people for the job. Best to leave it for younger legs. <coughs> well, now I can probably stop with that whole noir bit. It was fun, but really, I ain't much of an actor. I think that's been well established at this point. But really, that's it, guys. That's everything in Streets of New Capenna's story that you need to know about. Later, I'm going to do a post-mortem of New Capenna's story, just to go over what I think worked and what I think kind of fell flat for MTG storyline. I got a lot of bones to pick with some of these dead ends, but either way, that's a topic for another video. For now, I want to know what you guys think. What are your thoughts on Streets of New Capenna's story? What did you like about it? And what do you think it means for the future of Magic Storyline? Let me know in the comment section below. Now I appeal to your family ties, your idea of home. And as for your support here on the channel, if you enjoyed this video and want to see more, consider joining the Ether Hub by becoming a subscriber or maybe even joining as a member. Of course, you can also show your support by leaving this video a like and by hitting the notification bell, all of which goes a long way in helping grow our community. 
As always, thank you all so much for watching. Now scram, beat it, you see. And until next time, see ya.